December 5th, 1945, five U.S. Navy Avengers took off from a Florida air base on a routine training mission. But something went wrong. The tower suddenly received unexplainable radio messages. In a panic, the pilots reported they were totally lost. The ocean and sky appeared strange and unfamiliar. Then, silence. A Mariner rescue plane was dispatched to look for the missing flight. Suddenly, it too lost radio contact with the tower. A massive search was launched. But the five Avengers, the Mariner and 27 crewmen had totally vanished. No wreckage and no survivors were ever found. These planes vanished in an area off the coast of the United States known as the Bermuda Triangle. Here, the Mary Celeste was found abandoned. Here, huge cargo vessels have disappeared. Here, schooners and tankers alike vanish without trace. Military aircraft and commercial passenger planes fly into oblivion. The disappearances are apparently continuing today. It's reported that four boats and two planes a month set off into the triangle and never return. Since 1945, so the story goes, hundreds of ships and planes and thousands of people have mysteriously and completely vanished. Maybe that right here on the Earth, uh, on our own Earth, uh, quite close to the coast of the United States, something has happened or something is happening which sort of reverses the laws of nature with which we are presently familiar. We don't know what it is. That makes it a mystery. We have not solved it. If we knew what it was out there, we would not have a mystery. You would not be shooting this film of me today, and I would not have written a book on the subject. These waters off the Florida coast have been the graveyard of ships and planes in such numbers and in such strange circumstances that on the surface no rational explanation seems possible. Books on these disappearances are bestsellers, and if they are telling the story accurately, these are mysteries for which science has no answer. One of the authors is Richard Weiner, a deep-sea diver and sailor who's traveled the area extensively in his own boat. Weiner believes that three-quarters of the disappearances have natural causes, but that a quarter of them remain totally unexplainable. Charles Berlitz, who's written books on the Atlantis legend and other mysteries, as well as on the Triangle, believes the disappearances cannot be wholly accounted for by natural explanations. The triangle each author describes varies in size, depending on the incidents they want to include. Indeed, some writers even stretch it as far as the Irish coast. But how did it all begin? Lawrence Cush. The usual story is that this mystery goes clear back to the days of Christopher Columbus in 1492. In reality, it goes back to Vincent Gaddis in 1964. He wrote an article that was in Argosy magazine, and then he later in included that chapter, that as a chapter in his book. And this has been picked up by many people as their basis for the mystery. Now, Gatt what Gaddis did is picked up a number of articles like this Associated Press article in 1950, which f by E.V.W. Jones, and this is the first mention of the triangle as a mysterious area. An article in Fate magazine in 1952 added some details to these incidents uh, there are many other little ones, but uh, the main credit for at least the name of the Bermuda Triangle and the concept goes to Gaddis. After Gaddis' article came the books, 
all very popular and all telling more or less the same strange stories. And many of these same stories have been told in a film made by Richard Weiner. We'll use this film to explore whether the mystery has a rational solution or not. This is the case of the cabin cruiser witchcraft, as usually told in the legend. Vincent Price narrates. Dan Burak, a Miami Beach hotel owner, invited his good friend, Father Patrick Horgan, a Catholic priest from Fort Lauderdale, aboard his cabin cruiser to behold the Christmas lights of Miami from a mile out at sea, a mile that was to stretch into infinity. At 9 p.m., Miami Coast Guard received a message from Burak that his boat had struck a submerged object. At 9.03, a Coast Guard crew was on its way to assist. Meanwhile, the two men, knowing their boat was unsinkable due to built-in flotation chambers, had little to do but watch the lights from the vicinity of buoy number seven, one mile off Miami Beach. <laughs> The Coast Guardsmen reached the location given by Burak, but found only the buoy marking the ship channel into the harbor. There was no sign of the disabled boat or its occupants. Even though the missing boat was last heard of in an area lit by the glow of lights from Miami Beach, she was still in the Devil's Triangle. But did the story of the witchcraft really happen as it's usually told? Larry Cush. Charles Burlitt's account is similar to Richard Weiner's. Uh, he says, the incident of the witchcraft is an outstanding example of lightning-like sudden disappearance of a small craft, not only within sight of its port, but while located at one of the harbor's buoys. Uh, the boat proceeded through calm seas to about one mile from the shore and stopped to admire the lights from the vicinity of buoy number seven. So we have here a very tranquil scene. Maybe they had their foot up on the rail looking over the lights of Miami. Now this is the article from the Miami Herald, December 24th. One paragraph says, Stiff winds blowing from the north and northeast whipped the surface of the Atlantic into a carpet of foam against which a white boat like witchcraft would have been well camouflaged. So what's interesting about this incident, which does sound mysterious as it's always told, is are the things that have been left out. The most important thing that's been left out is that the weather was very bad at the time, and uh, nobody has mentioned that. In fact, we're given the impression that it was a very nice, calm scene. So the witchcraft disappeared in a storm and at night, a fact omitted by some of the books. This is boy number seven, a mile off Miami Beach, and these are the conditions that supposedly they were when the witchcraft was lost in 67. Calm sea, uh, nothing much to do but just sit around and admire the lights of Miami Beach. In reality, of course, we don't even know that the witchcraft was here. Nothing, there's nothing to verify that it was. Uh, the story is that uh, the Coast Guard took 20 minutes to get out after the radio call and we've sat here and drifted, and in just the space of a couple of minutes, we've just drifted a good hundred yards. So in 20 minutes in a storm, there's no, no telling how far they might have drifted. The Coast Guard didn't even know where to go because they, they didn't know where the witchcraft was. They never specified a position. No report at the time stated that the witchcraft was at a known location. And if it wasn't, its disappearance is that much less mysterious. Where did the authors get the information that it was near a buoy? From the Coast Guard. The From buoy, uh, buoy number seven. Mm. This, is, uh, this final message from it was released by, by the Coast Guard, although not released at the time, uh, where uh, uh, when uh, Burak had apparently put through the first message, the message to the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard had a cutter out there in about uh, 12 and a half minutes uh, to buoy number seven, he didn't say exactly what was wrong, but he just said he needed help. And when the Coast Guard cutter came there, and this is one mile from Miami, he and the yacht and his friend, of course, had disappeared. But there was originally a message that he was, uh, he located himself at buoy number seven.
but the Coast Guard had asked him to put up a flare, which suggests that they didn't know where he was at all. Well, uh, uh, it would have to be... Uh, this uh, was pretty well examined at the, at the time and has been examined since, and of course he was fairly near to Miami and never showed up. I think this is one of the one of the closest disappearances, besides the planes that have disappeared when they were coming in for a landing, of course. In fact, the buoy 7 location came from Richard Weiner. Where did he get it? Uh, they gave the distance from shore. I went out in my boat. I measured it. They set out from the inlet. And uh, they had to be within 100 yards of buoy 7. So the witchcraft's position is only an estimate. It's equally possible that in the storm it had drifted several miles which would help explain the disappearance. But such considerations couldn't explain away the loss of the Japanese ship Raifuku Maru. But as the ship steamed past the Bahama Islands, the Japanese crew found that Madison and blaspheme also existed in the waters of the Western Atlantic. For the last that was ever heard from the Raifuku Maru was the message Danger like dagger now, come quick, then silence. In fact, the last message was, now very danger, come quick. A ship actually saw the Raifukumaru sinking in a raging storm. A similar case is that of the yacht Ravenac. After spending a joyous Christmas in Key West, Harvey Conover, his wife, daughter, and son-in-law, set sail for Miami, 150 miles to the north, a course on which they would always be in sight of land. But nevertheless, it was still 150 miles in the Devil's Triangle. As the year 1957 was ending, a massive search was beginning, for Revenock had vanished. Vanished, in fact, in near hurricane winds, and the worst winter storm in Florida's history. Oh, I guess it was a today's chuckle I saw once where it said that some people like to drink from the fountain of knowledge and others only gargle. And this is what's happening is I think we're turning into a, a world of garglers who want to pretend like we're thinking very deeply, but we're really not. And to me, the tragic part of this is that most people are really not aware of this, nobody ever considers the possibility of questioning these films and these books that they read. But the general question remains, why do so many small craft, about a hundred a year, disappear in this area? Part of the answer lies in the careless habits of some of Florida's sailors. We regularly encounter uh, uh, boaters who call us and tell us they're in some nature of, uh, of distress and uh, tell us where they think they are, and we quite often find them as much as 40 to 50 miles away from the position where they actually think they are. Uh, I've had cases of a woman calling me up and asking me where Bimini is. It's not on our chart. And I asked her, well, where, what type of chart are you looking at? And she says, well, I've got the dictionary open to the World Atlas. And she's going to sail across the Gulf Stream uh, with the World Atlas. And this is a typical type call. Now first duty boat crew. The United States 7th Coast Guard District, which covers the triangle, is the busiest in the world. The 30 foot cabin cruiser, white with green trim, bimini top, Florida numbers. Each year they get 10,000 calls for help. So if only 100 of this 10,000 do disappear, the Coast Guard feels this is a really small percentage. And actually locating the people in difficulty is quite difficult. Sudden storms can blow up in these deceptively calm waters. The positions reported to the Coast Guard searchers can be miles off. Many of the people they're looking for are simply not equipped for the conditions they meet. Quite a few of the boaters do not compensate or overcompensate for the Gulf Stream when they're traveling to the mainland of Bimini or vice versa. And they wind up missing the island and there's very little out there in the way of land masses for them to hit. And they keep drifting at a nice steady 
four knots per hour, approximately six miles. Every hour they're moving six miles in a northerly direction. If the person is not located, they can uh, very easily become lost east of Miami and wind up in the Jacksonville to Savannah, Georgia area. This is a, a good day. We're running about two to three foot seas. And uh, we'll run a two mile track space in a search for about this altitude, two to four mile track space. The white caps, the garbage in the water are all very confusing to the searchers. And we're looking anywhere from directly below us to a mile out. So the number of the possibility of finding somebody is about 10% or less. A person in the water presents about the same size as a soccer ball or basketball. So picture trying to see a soccer ball in a farmer's field at 500 feet doing 130 miles an hour. That's a difficulty in finding a man in the water. A lot of it's search by but a lot of it's luck when you're actually locating somebody. Such factors make the loss of numerous small vessels understandable but they don't explain the much larger disappearances in the Triangle. Two KC-135 Stratotankers took off from Homestead Air Force Base on August 28, 1963. These were the first two jet aircraft to add their names to the ambiguous chronicle of the Devil's Triangle. Eleven crewmen were aboard the two planes. Their destination when they lifted into the sky was secret. The last position they radioed was 300 miles southwest of Bermuda. Then they vanished. Whether this disappearance is a mystery depends on what piece of evidence you accept. The first report stated that the wreckage found from both planes indicated a mid-air collision. The two planes had been flying west when they vanished. The first wreckage was found here. About a day later, more wreckage was found 160 miles away. Most writers have used this second report to argue that the planes had mysteriously crashed independently. Well, the telling of this mystery is, is fairly uniform throughout most of the writers. Gaddis says the obvious explanation was that the tankers had collided in the air, but two days later they found the second wreckage and he ends up saying, what happened remains a mystery. Weiner said that the wreckage from both locations was definitely ascertained as being from the two missing planes. Berlitz uh, says, uh, again, the same thing. The two spots of wreckage, it, it's inexplicable. It just cannot be figured out. So the mystery hinges on whether the second site really contained debris from a KC-135. Charles Burlitz says it did. I believe among the old junk uh, was found wreckage uh, from what was apparently the second plane, including a, uh, a lifeboat. However, another report a day later stated that the second wreckage site was simply seaweed, driftwood, and an old buoy. Oh, no. The second wreckage was wreckage was picked up by a ship. A Coast Guard cutter picked it up. I have here the report of the Air Rescue Squadron of their search mission. And they point out that at the first area of wreckage, they found serial numbers from a number of things like life vests, helmets, radar receivers. A large amount of wreckage was found at the first spot. And the serial numbers on this wreckage, uh, the different uh, devices showed that these were parts from both planes. This report seems to clear up the mystery. The debris identified at the first site from both planes backs up the initial reports of a mid-air collision. It shows that the mystery came about because the wrong report was used as evidence. Had the incidents all happened like everybody said, then we would have had a mystery, but the fact that in case after case I found uh, the incidents didn't happen the way they said. Things had been omitted, they'd been added, uh, distorted and changed. And there is nobody uh, who is saying that there is a mystery in the Bermuda Triangle who is basing this on good, accurate information. All the people who say that there is a mystery out there are basing that on very inaccurate, distorted information. But logical solutions to this and other triangle mysteries are still challenged. Couldn't the authorities be covering up the real facts? 
Doesn't the sheer number of cases point to something strange? Some of us think that it has to do with magnetic fields in the area. We know that there are magnetic anomalies. We think that these magnetic fields, for some reason, are concentrated at one part of the Earth in this Bermuda Triangle. And they're brought to such a field of such a power of concentration that planes and ships and even people that go into them or sort of stray into them uh, eventually encounter the anomalies that I've discussed up to now, and they may be strong enough to actually change the composition of matter. In other words, change matter itself into another dimension. <laughs> There are other theories, time-space warps, UFOs capturing the missing vessels, a power source from the lost continent of Atlantis sucking them into the depths. All of them are based on the premise that the disappearances are so mysterious that some strange force must be at work. Theories of unknown forces are then used to explain cases like the Star Tiger. This British airliner disappeared in 1947 on a flight from the Azores to Bermuda. To this day, no one knows what happened to it, and since no wreckage was ever found, it's not difficult for writers to suggest it was somehow spirited away. Now, a lot is made in the case of the Star Tiger, the fact that no wreckage is found, yet uh, they ignore the fact that this did occur at night. The weather was bad at the time. They didn't know precisely where the Star Tiger was when it went down. Uh, the search, search planes didn't actually get out there for five or six hours, and by the time it was daylight, it was even longer. And many people overlook the very elementary fact that an airplane is not a boat. And uh, it's just not a mystery when nothing is found from a plane that ditches out in the ocean. There remains a mystery, though, as to the reasons for the crash itself. The official report suggested various mechanical failures, but came to no firm conclusions. One line in the report, however, that some external cause may have overwhelmed man and machine, a reference to the weather, was used by implication to suggest things like interference from flying saucers. Suppose, for instance, that I said, uh, um, I have proof that a parrot was kidnapped by an extraterrestrial and is being held captive to teach the extraterrestrial's earthling language. And I challenge you to prove that that's not true. And I, I even allow you to use Einstein's theory of relativity if you like. But there is no way that you can prove that that is not true. So when we have somebody who's telling a story, you just cannot prove it's true. So what, what uh, it, I think it's unfortunate that all it requires for something to become part of what we call the mass public mind is all we need is for somebody to, to suggest it or ask the question. You know, could it be that Rhett, Rhett Butler is still alive and well living in Ohio somewhere? There is, uh, the burden of proof should be on the person who says that to prove that it's true, to show where he got his information. I think enough things have happened in the area uh, to indicate that there is something wrong with the area. This is a, a general knowledge among pilots. Of course, uh, pilots who uh, tend to avoid uh, parts of the area, of course, you don't know where the danger points are because it's sort of, sort of sporadic. Uh, pilots who avoid it don't think they're going to be pursued by monsters, but they do know that their instruments go off. The U.S. Coast Guard ship Hollyhock suffered such an instrument failure. It wasn't particularly special, but in the triangle, any incident, however small, can be made to seem mysterious. The Hollyhock lost radio contact with the Florida coast, but strangely could pick up California. Radio tower two, six, seven. It also picked up a landmass on radar where there was no land for miles. Understandable or unexplainable? Well, if they can't explain it, a mystery is unusual. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen every time it goes, they go out. It may happen to a vessel out there, a Coast Guard cutter, 
once a year, twice a year, maybe once every four years to this particular ship. It was rather strange because they don't know what caused it, and that makes it strange. Coast Guard officer Wisman told the Hollyhock stories to Richard Weiner. They certainly happened, but did he suggest they were unusual? This isn't particularly peculiar. We just came back on another trip in the area. We were on the north coast of Cuba, and we could talk to the Coast Guard station in Mobile, Alabama, and we still couldn't get a hold of Florida. So it happens, particularly at night, where the atmos atmospherics change. So it's not a strange phenomenon at all. Well, I'm, I, I admit, you know, it is strange, but not unusual. But, and it is unusual, but it's not, a, not that uh, uh, supernatural or anything, because they don't know what it is. Did he, did he explain to you what caused it? He said it happened all the time, but I want to know what caused it. What caused his radar to show a landmass where there wasn't a landmass? That I want to know. As far as the landmass on the radar, uh, I would say it's not peculiar either. Uh, many times, rain, squalls, rain clouds, or something like this, sea conditions, can look like land uh, the further out on the radar that you get. So I would say that's not peculiar either. So the Coast Guard says these are normal phenomena. If they weren't in the triangle, they'd have passed unnoticed. It's a known fact for the Coast Guard and uh, the governments have not been able to explain the reason behind it. They know it happens. They know it's not an extremely dangerous situation unless it throws your navigation off or something. But it does happen, and it's mysterious. And as I said at the opening of this interview, that anything we don't know is mysterious. And if I didn't try to make my book mysterious, I would have another book like uh, Kush's is just a bunch of uh, uh, facts and incidents, and what most of the reviewers say is just plain dull reading. I try to make my book interesting. I, I just mentioned another technique that they use, uh, the not yet. They will say experts have not yet discovered what force is out there. Well, that implies that there is a force out there, and these experts are trying to find out what this force is. And in many cases, or in, in fact, that's just not true. They are not trying to find any mysterious force. The whole triangle mystery might never have happened if it weren't for one story. Flight 19. The events of Flight 19 happened 30 years ago here at what is now Fort Lauderdale International Airport. Then it was the scene of the biggest triangle story of them all. The legend version is told in Richard Weiner's film. The tower was old and wooden, as were the barracks that housed the officers and men stationed at Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station during and right after World War II. And it was in these barracks that 15 men in particular were quartered. 15 men who on December 4th, 1945, were scheduled to participate on a routine training flight aboard five Grumman Avenger torpedo bombers. A mission that to this day remains one of the most baffling mysteries of the sea. One Marine gunner, Corporal Alan Cosner, missed the flight. What strange distortion of fate caused Corporal Cosner not to take this flight into oblivion? The mission of the day was a routine patrol flight, east for 160 miles, north for 40 miles, then southwest back to Fort Lauderdale. A triangular course within the larger Devil's Triangle. It was two o'clock when squadron leader, Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, felt the ground give way beneath his plane. Once airborne, Flight 19 grouped into formation and headed east out over the Atlantic. What were Lieutenant Taylor's thoughts as he looked out at the other four planes? Was he thinking of the day's mission? Or is it possible he had that same peculiar feeling that Corporal Cosner had had back at the base? But for Flight 19, it was too late to turn back. Fort Lauderdale Tower received radio contact from the five planes 15 minutes before they were due to land. But they did not request landing instructions as expected. We seem to be off course. We cannot see land. Repeat, we cannot see land. We're not sure of our position. We seem to be lost. We don't know which way is west. Everything is wrong. 
strange. We can't be sure of any direction. It looks like we are. These panicky messages about the strange ocean, the skies looking wrong, are central to the mystery of Flight 19. But did they in fact happen? Who reported them? All the books quote them, including Richard Weiner's. Did they come from Cosner? And I quoted Cosner in both my film and in the book that the plane, that uh, the message from the planes, the last that he remembers distinctly and he's sure of, is that there was talk about entering white water. There was static, broken talk, and the very last thing he heard them say is, we're completely lost. Two officers in the tower during the flight were training officer Don Poole and safety officer Walt Winchell. Well, we monitored uh, all the transmissions coming in, going out, and uh, I don't recall uh, ever hearing uh, some of the transmissions that were claimed to have been made by Mr. Taylor about the wild water and we're upside down and we don't know which way is west and our compasses don't work and all that. Uh, they were lost, yes. And uh, that, that was, a, that was uh, very evident from uh, uh, Lieutenant Taylor's transmissions. But uh, there, was, there was nothing like that, uh, that uh, water was white or uh, that we understand there's all kinds of stories out, but it can't be confirmed at all by, by me. I, Walt and I were both in the tower the entire time. You say the record shows the following, and then you have the message from Taylor about not knowing which way west is, not sure of his position, even the ocean doesn't look right. What record is that? The record of the people who were there at the time uh, in the tower. You see, uh, when the word got out that the planes were in some sort of difficulty, which no one could understand, people who were on the field, especially uh, staff officers, came uh, and uh, from the command post uh, came to the tower, so there's a big crowd there. We've talked to two of the people who were there all the time, and they say they never heard that message. I've talked, uh, I've talked to people too, including uh, the intelligence officer who was there at the time. And of course, you must remember that when this first became known, and it's been known for several years, that uh, uh, the records of, that is the records and memories of the people who were there at the time uh, were were well, well documented. We haven't talked, in fact, to the, it must be the intelligent uh, officer. Would it be possible to get his telephone number off you so we could talk to him? Because this is obviously something we need to check. Yes, he'd be uh, very happy to. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Wershing, still, uh, many of these people, of course, are still alive mm -hmm. and uh, have a clear memory of what happened. Commander Wershing didn't keep first-hand notes, as Charles Burlett says, but did he remember the messages he is quoted as giving? No, I never, I never heard the message about the uh, where everybody said this looks strange and even the ocean doesn't look the same because I didn't get there uh, to the base of the tower until after uh, the tower no longer could be heard by the airplanes. And that message probably came in before. We heard the ones about the compasses all being wrong where pilots talk to pilots and uh, we, those are the only things we heard. So everyone agrees that the planes were lost, but the really strange messages cannot be confirmed by anyone at the base at the time. Since they're quoted in all the books, where did they come from? I've traced the strange messages of Flight 19 back to this article, The Mystery of the Lost Patrol by Alan Eckert, uh, in American Legion magazine, April 1962. I've uh, corresponded with Mr. Eckert, and he can't remember now where he got these quotations from. I've also contacted Boston University, which the library there has his papers, and there's nothing in the files there to show where he got the information. So this is as far back as anybody can trace the message of Flight 19. Now, like many other uh, uh, parts of the story, this was picked up by Vincent Gaddis, uh, practically word for word, and then it goes on. Everybody else has it, Weiner, Berlitz, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, the story of Flight 19, as we know it, basically came from this article by Eckert. That source came from the man that coined the phrase Bermuda Triangle, Vincent Gaddis, in his book Invisible Horizons. He had one chapter called the Bermuda Triangle, which he brought to light all these disappearances. And I used him as my source, and... Uh, 
The Navy says that's not what they say, but they haven't out and out denied it. This is the report, the Navy report of the incident on microfilm. And this right here is that microfilm converted in into paper. It's about a 500 page report. And I've spent probably a thousand hours over several years now going over and over this report and finding out what really happened. And it's nothing like the story of Flight 19 as we commonly know it. That story has grown up over the years uh, as folklore. Everybody has repeated what the previous writer said and it's been added to and, and deleted from. And like so many other incidents in the Triangle, the loss of these five planes did not happen anything like what all the writers would have us believe. To try and find out what really happened to Flight 19, we flew with the Coast Guard the exact route of the missing planes. Our story is based on what we saw and on the official report of Flight 19. The flight headed east from Fort Lauderdale to carry out a bombing run at Hens and Chicken Shoal, continue east for 67 miles, turn north for 73 miles, then west-southwest back to the base. The practice bombing of hens and chickens appears to have gone according to plan. The planes then continued east until the turn north onto the second leg. Okay, this is the uh, turn point the uh, flight that Taylor is taking. His heading was 091, we're going to turn to 346, which was his heading. And this is what he would have seen, which is virtually nothing, virtually no horizon. It's kind of hazy and just water beats the sky. It's kind of a, a nothing zone. Okay, I'm going to start the turn now. And we're coming up on his heading right now. It was now that things apparently began to go wrong. The first messages from Flight 19 were not those of the legend. They were picked up by Commander Robert Cox, who at 3.40 p.m. was flying over Fort Lauderdale. He reported the following reenacted messages from Flight 19. I don't know where we are. We must have got lost after that last turn. Both my compasses are out. I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm over land, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm in the Keys, but I don't know how far down. I don't know how to get to Fort Lauderdale. The commander of Flight 19, Lieutenant Taylor, had recently moved from South Florida. Now, as he reassumed lead position over his student pilots, he believed he was here, over familiar territory, the broken islands of the Florida Keys. In fact, he was probably far to the north, here, over Great Sail Key. How could he have been so mistaken? Hey, I'd say uh, somebody that they was probably used to the Florida Keys and was disoriented on a bad day conceivably even worse than today, breaking out into the situation kind of as we are now, would mistake the islands that we're coming up on for part of the Florida Keys. You can almost see how this could fake somebody out that uh, wasn't really terribly familiar with the area. So Taylor's flight was over these islands north of the Bahamas. And they are remarkably similar to these islands, the Florida Keys, where he thought he was. The Florida Keys are so similar, in fact, to this chain north of the Bahamas that Taylor might have relied on this mistaken identification and disbelieved his compasses. First of all, if you have no reference to a shoreline that you're familiar with, it's very easy to not believe your instruments. Like you can see that you're flying north or south, east or west, and not, not want to believe it and end up doing something very ridiculous. It happened to me once about three years ago. It was just that two of us were on the airplane and we decided we were doing something absolutely wrong, and we just settled down and decided that we had to believe our instruments. But if I think if it happened to us in the airplane, we could have, I could have gotten in trouble. But this happened on the West Coast on a very dark night. So um, it could very easily happen to other people. It could have happened to this, uh, Lieutenant Taylor, it's hard to say. Flight 19 still headed north. Uh, as he approached the island here, he decided to, that he was in the Florida Keys took a steer to course to get him back to Florida mainland he'd run into absolutely nothing between here and Africa except deep water.
Radio communications were bad. The tower couldn't contact Flight 19, so Taylor remained uncertain of his position. Believing he was around the Keys, he would head north and east to return to the mainland. But the same course, if taken from the area where he really was, would carry him away from Florida and out into the Atlantic. And by now, the weather was deteriorating. And here we are heading into nothingness. That's some lousy weather. Which was just about what he would have experienced, I would imagine. Of course, the man was uh, confused and probably a little frightened at the time. And don't forget, he's trying to herd about three or four inexperienced students around the skies with him. He undoubtedly had his hands filled. We heard one of the students, <clears throat> he was unidentified, but he was one of the students in the flight, who said, damn it, if we'd head west, we'd get home. And this was very loud and clear. Didn't he at one time turn west and flew west for a few minutes and then the next thing we knew he turned around and flew back east again because he was convinced that he was in the gulf the flight now constantly changed direction one of the planes in the flight thinks if we went 270 we could hit land but taylor ordered an opposite heading we are heading 030 for 45 minutes then we'll fly north to make sure we are not over the gulf of mexico a course that would take them away from the base. Flight, this is later. Change course to 090 for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Now flying due east. I receive you very weak. We are now flying 270. And back west again. We will fly 270 until we hit the beach and run out of gas. Flight, this is later. When the first man gets down to 10 gallons of gas, we'll all land in the water together. Does everyone understand? But later, the flight again turned east. At 6 p.m., a radio fix at last located Flight 19 north of the Bahamas. The legend ignores this. How do they know it was north of Grand Bahama Island? How do they know the distance? With only one bearing. You cannot take a pinpoint and plot a position with only one bearing. Any airman or any mariner will tell you that. It's impossible. You can get them along that line someplace, but you can't tell how far. It's just like a car on a road. If he's talking to you on radio, he can tell you, well, I'm driving along Highway 1, but I don't know how far I am out on it. Well, it's the same thing. They knew that he was along that uh, direction, but they didn't know how far out he was. They had two radio fixes on it. They did not have two radio fixes on it. They could have had few, two radio fixes, and as I said in my book, that the government goofed up and you don't see anything of this in the government records. There was more than one radio fix. In fact, six separate radio stations each obtained numerous fixes over a period of about an hour. These gave an approximate position within a 100-mile radius of 29 degrees north and 79 degrees west. This placed the missing Flight 19 some 150 miles north of their base, way off course and totally lost. It was just disorientation. He was just mentally confused and panicked, is, uh, is my estimate of the situation, of what really happened. Of course, they milled around out there till they ran out of gas that night. Flight 19's last message came, according to all the writers, in late afternoon. In fact, the planes were heard until after 7 p.m. By putting the last message too early, another mystery is created. And then immediately, according to the stories, the Sir Martin Mariner search plane took off. So we picture the search plane going out in nice, sunshiny weather and late in the afternoon and just simply vanishing in a, in a sky, a nice, friendly sky. Minutes after the appalling messages were received from Flight 19, Banana River Naval Air Station dispatched a giant Martin Mariner flying boat with a crew of 13 to assist the afflicted Avengers. In fact, the Mariner took off not at 4.25 p.m. in daylight, but at 7.27 p.m. at night. The legend has it disappearing before it even took off. Most of the writers place its departure far too early, causing confusion as to what really happened. 
In charge of Mariner rescue missions at the time was Richard Adams. The Mariner carried a very large uh, load of gasoline which permitted it to stay in the air for many hours. In fact, we used to call it the flying gas tank because uh, it was carried so much gasoline and the fumes which would collect inside the hull could make it a potentially flying bomb. Uh, it could have happened uh, in the excitement of the uh, search that they did not take the normal precautions that we always took uh, in the PBMs to make sure nobody smoked in the, in the gasoline compartments. The Mariner was tracked on radar until 20 minutes after the real takeoff time, when it suddenly disappeared from the screen. At this precise position and time, a huge mid-air explosion was seen. The Mariner had in fact blown up. The final mystery is why no trace was ever found of Flight 19. Every type of vessel from Navy submarines just returned from Pacific War duty to sleek new Coast Guard cutters joined the search, which stretched for over 200 miles out into the Gulf of Mexico to 400 miles into the Atlantic. The search continued in a crisscross pattern that covered 280,000 square miles. But when the ships and planes returned to their bases, the story of the missing men and planes was the same. No survivors, no victims, no wreckage found. No survivors, no victims. No wreckage found. But is this really mysterious? This is how many mysteries come about because people just look at the end result but they don't bother finding out about the details of how it actually happened. For instance, the ditching actually occurred in the dark during a storm and these are, uh, there was a ship in the area that reported rough, very rough seas. So what we had here was not a flight of five planes with five experienced pilots ditching on a nice sunny afternoon, which is what the story is. But we had four student pilots and a disoriented instructor coming in ditching in the dark in a storm. And, and as a pilot, that's something that I would prefer not to spend my evenings doing because uh, it, it could be the chances of a successful ditching under circumstances like that are practically negligible. This is a plane similar to the Avenger. The Avenger's ditching capability is about the same. Now, according to the pilot's handbook, uh, under the section of ditching, this airplane should have good water landing characteristics. Actual water landings indicate that the airplane will remain afloat for approximately 15 to 20 seconds. So I've talked to uh, several Avenger pilots and they say actually this manual is maybe a little bit too quick. They would give it as much as 45 seconds. So again, it's not exactly a, a leisurely bailout once they're in the water, assuming that they survive the crash, which is unlikely. I really didn't think we'd find anything because the weather that night deteriorated. The time they went down, that they couldn't possibly have survived uh, when the planes hit. If they'd have been lucky enough to get out, they still couldn't have survived in a raft with that, with that high and heavy a seas. It's, it, it's just impossible. There are many reasons for the loss of Flight 19, but the legend version, with its untraceable messages, its incorrect times, its omission of relevant facts, makes it seem more mysterious than it ever was. Flight 19 is the cornerstone of the Triangle mystery and is typical of the popular accounts of the Triangle. The accounts sound authoritative. They're simply not. I visited this uh, fourth or fifth grade class that I had talked to, and uh, we talked a little bit about the Triangle and techniques that they had used. When I visited them again several weeks ago, they had uh, seen, I think it was the Outer Space Connection or one of the ancient astronaut films, and they had just ripped it to shreds. Instead of saying, gee whiz, look at those planes out there. How could there possibly be airports in Peru? Or how could they have made those figures on the ground? Instead, what they were doing was asking questions like, what is the source of their information? Is their interpretation right? 
uh, are there other alternatives that they might come up with or have they left anything out? Now this is an entirely different set of question and this is the open-minded skeptic skepticalness that I'm after. There is nothing wrong with a good mystery, providing such stories are recognized as science fiction and not called science fact. Today, many books on similar mysterious themes claim to deal with phenomena that are beyond the grasp of rational science. These books are popular. They claim to stretch the mind. Those who don't believe are dismissed as short-sighted skeptics. But this dismissal is only valid if the evidence for such claims is good. In the case of the disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle, there is rarely good evidence. And when the inaccuracies are exposed, the mystery disappears. Science doesn't need to find an answer to the questions posed by the Triangle, because those questions aren't valid in the first place. 613 straight ahead, minimum delay in normal length of traffic waiting to depart. Left turn at the taxiway, then go to ground on 121.7. We've seen that disappearances of boats and military aircraft are without mystery. But is it still true that pilots don't like to fly over the Bermuda Triangle because of its reputation for swallowing airplanes? A senior editor of the magazine Aviation Week and Space Technology has made a special study of aircraft accidents within the Triangle. Is the record especially bad? Philip Klass. The fact is that contrary to the popular myth, the Bermuda Triangle is one of the safest places in the world to fly into or out of if you go on a scheduled airliner. In the past quarter century, there have been more than a million scheduled airline flights into, out of, and over the Bermuda Triangle. And there has not been a single, not one, scheduled airliner disappear mysteriously. In fact, during that past quarter century, there have been only two airline accidents in which there were any fatalities. Perhaps the best indication that there is no unusual hazard in the so-called Bermuda Triangle is the fact that it is often said that a pilot is the first man at the scene of an aircraft accident, meaning he's up in front, he's the first one to get it. Now, the airline pilots have an option. They can uh, vote for or try to obtain any routes that they want, and it's a matter of seniority. I have talked to several of the airlines that fly into the so-called Bermuda Triangle area. Not one of them has had any trouble getting airline pilots to volunteer for those routes. In fact, they're very popular routes. Since commercial traffic is so heavy in the Triangle area, do the pilots find that they have instrument trouble more often than is usual in other areas? The fact is that a, an airline pilot or co-pilot flight crew is required by the Federal Aviation Administration and by his airline to report any anomalous behavior. If his landing receiver, if his communications receiver malfunctions, he must log this so that when the airplane lands, maintenance people can get in and check it out. If it's a defective radio receiver, it must be replaced. Isn't it still true that small private aircraft fly into the area and with alarming frequency are never heard from again? Yes, aircraft have disappeared mysteriously while flying in the Bermuda Triangle. But these aircraft are small airplanes, single-engine, twin-engine aircraft. And in fact, I asked the National Transportation Safety Board, which is responsible for investigating all accidents, including those of aircraft that disappear, to print out for me, to give me facts and the records of all aircraft that had disappeared over a 10-year period. This was from 1964 to 1973. These are all aircraft that have disappeared between roughly the mid-Atlantic to the mid-Pacific, which would encompass the Bermuda Triangle. And what it shows, and I've analyzed this, is that in this 10-year period, a total of 25 small single-engine, twin-engine aircraft did go down somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle, have never been found. Seemingly, that's very mysterious. But if one examines this, one finds that many more went down over the continental United States, are lying here, the wreckage is somewhere in the continental U.S., and they have never been found either. What the analysis of these 25 aircraft shows is that two-thirds of those pilots did not have instrument rating. That is, they were not trained to fly in bad weather. 
So if they took off from Florida for the Bahamas, for example, and the weather looked good, but a sudden storm came in and they found themselves enveloped in clouds, they could easily lose their way. Um, another one half of these pilots that were lost had fewer than a thousand flying hours. They were relative beginners as pilots. And in fact, if one analyzes these 25 lost aircraft, you find one in which the pilot reported that she was lost and running out of fuel. Another one in which the pilot reported that he, his engine had failed and he was having to land in rough seas. Surely there's no mystery involved in that. But proponents of a mysterious power in the Devil Sea don't accept explanations of routine mechanical failure. They point out that planes vanish without a trace. No survivors, no wreckage. Surely, landing in water, pilots should have a good chance of being found. To someone who has never made a, a water landing, a ditching, it might seem that it's relatively easier landing on what appears to be soft water. But in fact, that's not the case. And anyone who's ever dived off a diving board and done a belly flop in the water knows how hard the impact can be. It's not possible in the course of one short hour to examine every incident cited by the popular books. But in every case where we've gone to the original source, official reports or people involved, the mystery evaporates. Boats and aircraft behave in the Bermuda Triangle just as they behave everywhere else in the world.